Welcome back, everyone. So, Liberators, you have slept through the night doing your tasks that you want to do before bed and awoken peacefully in the morning. You hear a knock at your door. Uh, Liberators, are you ready to head to your quest to Arrowwatch? Just a minute. Oh, Horatio steps out. Kyle is ready. I'm like five minutes late, but I'm... Duran has already been awake for a few hours, so he is already ready. As was Manaka, just already ready. So everyone is waiting on King. Sorry, they made me drink so much last night. It's all right, King. You had a good time? There, my hangover's not that bad. I rolled pretty good. <laughs> Let's head to the rear entrance of the Seekers Guild. There, I have a friend, Glem, who's going to dr- drive the caravan while you protect it. And I know Electrum Seekers is like yourself. We'll do this without any problem. Well, follow me. He begins to walk. Are we expecting any type of specific individual or creature or clan to attack? Any demon can attack on the way. Every time we've sent this caravan over to Arrowwatch, it's been attacked. Glem can give you more information as he was the one who made it there and back. I'll say don't forget about the duo we met in Small Point. Jalen and Balin. At small point, isn't that where you guys said the the crystal was corrupted? Maybe something's going on on the way to Arrowwatch. It's a possibility. We should just... Small point's very far out of the way. That is where we did encounter it. But that's where we first met them. It's far out of the way by land, but not by water or air. Well, I don't know who this Balin or Jalen is, but I did hear about some... Succubi is kind of attacking the area as well, but there's nothing some electric seekers like yourselves can't handle, I'm sure. Well, in any case, follow me. Still continues to walk. I'll like hang towards the back or towards Duran, and I'll ask him, did you happen to have any luck when you were out in the city? Duran grins, and he um, he presents to, uh, he presents the king a pair of bands as requested. Thank you so much. Are you sure I don't owe you anything? Ah, it was with Kyle's help we were able to get this. He was um, persuasive in getting the blacksmith to give it to us at a discount. I'll, like, look down and sort of blush, and then I'll switch to Elvin, and I'll say, Sorry, I I thought you were going to be discreet. I was hoping to present them with these and I did not wish for them to know, but I thank you very much anyway for getting me these fine specimens. And I'll quickly pocket the rings and, like, walk away. Brand looks quizzical about the ex- exchange, but he doesn't pursue it. All right, you grab the platinum bands from Duran and place it in on your belongings. You follow Lancel down one of the many staircases that fill the inner mountain sanctum, its stony walls slightly hypnotic as they dimly glow a variety of colors. After about 10 minutes of this technicolor journey, you arrive to a large 30-foot portcullis gate consisting of a lattice grill made of stone and metal. You see two large gear-shaped objects with chains leading up to the top of the gate on each side of it. Standing at attention when you arrive are two tieflings wearing leather armor. Oh, oh, oh um, good day, Mr. Gretto. Off on a new quest today. <laughs> no, uh, not me. I'm leading our new Electrum Seekers to Glem, so that we can finally complete the request from Arrowwatch. All right then, sir. Uh, One moment. One of the tieflings runs over to the left gear, begins to spin a metal pike attached to it, creating a reverberating cranking sound. After a few seconds, you all feel a burst of frigid air collide with your skin. And once you do a quick shiver, you notice behind the checkered metal gate, the mountain wall slowly lowering like a stone drawbridge. Once she finishes doing the final turn of the gear, the other tiefling quickly runs over and spins the the other the one on the other side. This one raises the metal gates. It finally reaches its apex, and he says, "Well, happy hunting and good luck." Well then, let's take our steps to the unknown. And he begins to walk outside of the mountainside, and you all take your steps, stepping onto the snow ground into the boreal taiga landscape edged with snow-capped mountains, an eerie glow set upon the horizon by the eternal setting sun. He's right down here. Just, uh, 
you know, don't stare, all right? He doesn't like it when people, well, let's just go. Lanzo begins to walk down the winding path. Before you, you see at the end down the hill is a small gnomish man with pink fuzzy hair, but he has a scar on his left chin that reaches all the way up from the bottom of a cheek to the top of his left temple. Monaco stares. You walk up to him and he says, well, these are the seekers who are going to protect you and finally get all this stuff to Arrow Watch. The gnome looks directly at Monaco staring at him. Hey, what are you looking at, huh? Huh? What are you looking at? How you staring at my scar, huh? Hey, 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 hey. And he goes, no, no. She quickly looks away and kind of like, like puts her hands up like, oh, oh, no, I, I just, I just, before attempting to diffuse the situation by saying in gnomish, I just haven't seen many of you around here. Roll me a charisma check. 19. He looks at you and goes to say something and then he goes, nah. Anyway, so these are the guys? You gotta protect me, right? That's the job. We will do our best to do so. All right, then. And he touches the scar as he says this. I I don't want it to end up like last time. Everyone was just massacred, and I barely managed to escape with this. Don't you stare at it. It's a beauty mark now. It is okay. I mean, these are types of things that happen all the time. If anything, think of it as a story as opposed to a crutch, I guess. Are you patronizing me? No, not at all. Up right up to your face, but he doesn't really get to your face because he's so short. No, not at all, friend. I'm just saying that um, as adventurers, we see scars all the time. And isn't Duran, like, all scarred up? Yeah, Duran's got by scars on his body from combat snare. Yeah, and then I point over to Duran. And we had once traveled with a teammate who was missing a hand. It didn't slow her down in any way. So instead of looking at this R as something negative, look at it as a story of how strong you were. Roll me a persuasion check at advantage. Ooh. An 11. He goes, let's just get the hell out of here. And he hops on towards this uh, large caravan you see. And there's actually two sections of the caravan. You have the, uh, the one right behind him that he's hitched on and behind it there's a another one that's hitched to that you hear kind of shifting of metal objects other things inside the cloth covering Lancel turns to you says well good luck and see you when you get back i'm expecting great things from you all and he gives you a nod and begins walking back towards the secrets guild Man- Manaka says, oh so what what, what what happened on the trip why were you attacked do you know didn't you have Symphony? He's like, yeah, of course we have Symphony, but I don't know. Something weird happened, and all these succubi just came and, and attacked us. Then these other demons came, and slowly, and we were overrun. I barely made it out of my life. I don't even know where the other belongings went. The caravan was just tossed to the side of the road, and I ran for it. it took me days to make it back here. Monaco put a hand on her wrist to kind of give her a shield look, and then to say, we'll keep you safe this time. You better! So you can travel in the back caravan if you want, or you can walk on the side. It's not going to be moving very fast because there's a horse-drawn caravan. I'll go next to him and like sit in the seat next to him and say, I apologize for my comrades earlier. They're not the best with people. And then I'll say, my name is King. I'd like to properly introduce myself. Yeah, no king of mine. Yeah. Anyway, I'm Glem. That's all you need to know. Glem, nice to meet you. King's just a nickname my friends gave me. I say I'll be protecting you while we uh, uh, while we travel, and I'll, I'll accompany you here at the front. He's like, you're kind of small. Or uh, what are you? He looks you up and down. Watch your mouth. I'll say um, I'm a half elf, and as he says, like you're kind of small. I'll say it's okay, but I'll call forth. I'll start quickly chanting in Sylvan and call forth Chastifold and make like it like fly up from around the side and like gracefully like spin to a point and come to my side and like as like a show of power that I have I can do things. Okay, roll me a performance check. I'll that's okay, I guess. I'll leave it. It's not the best performance, but it's a good show of your skills with Chastifold. Gnome looks on and doesn't look like he seems impressed, but he does nod. As well. Well you're pl- Electrum Seekers, right? So I'm, I'm sure we'll be fine. And he goes, yeah, and begins to move the caravan. Oh, we also had a long rest, right? Yes. 
Oh, let me give you guys a long rest. Thank you. The yeah, long rest, you could choose your spells and change everything up that you have. As the caravan starts moving, Minako will pass out snacks. And as she does so, she sort of gives some encouraging words to everyone. Just like, this will this will keep you up, up your strength and you don't have to worry about it. Everyone's, everyone's got this. And uh, in spending 10 minutes of doing so, she'll use her uh, inspiring leader feat to give everybody 13 temporary ones. Or 14, actually. Oh, nice. Wow. Awesome. You eat this delicious meal, listen to her encouraging words, and you feel inspired and comfortable, happy to have her in your presence, and you will gain your 14 temporary hit points. I do not know how he traveled with that food like this before. She's beaming and seems very pleased as everyone devours their meal. Horatio takes out the book of demons and whatnot and uh, begins just reading up on the sucky by and whatnot. Yeah, and I was going to say, I pull out my book after listening to the inspiring feet. And as we start to set off, I'll uh, resume reading as we sit in the cart and go. So, you all begin to journey down the mountainside on the path from Frostmoor to Arrowwatch. There are trees sparsely spread in the landscape. Their leaves dull. You look off into the distance and you could swear you can see a large tree-like structure coming from the mountain pass. Recognizing that to be tree that you had grown from the heaven's root, you all smile to yourselves while passing into the horizon of this dust filled sky. So it will take you a few days, uh, about at this current pace that he's going, about three days to make it, three to four days, if uh, nothing comes up, to make it to Arrow Watch. Is there anything you want to do during day one? But do you want to spend it reading your books? It's you can If you want to read and not walk, you can always hop into the caravan. If you want to talk to anyone or to Glem, you can as well. But if not, you will pass through day one. I sure would hop into the caravan to read, but like take a quick look at what he's uh, transporting, if I can see it. As you look around and see the items, they're all in boxes. You can open up one of the boxes if you like. Yeah, he would open one, one of the boxes. Okay, so you open up the box, it's sealed, but you can open it and reclose it once you're finished. And as you lift up the top, you witness metal uh, weapons. As you go towards another one, you see shards of different sizes of the Holy Crystal, a mine here in Shivern. It seems to be um, a caravan full of these items. There's also inside of the caravan a large bucket or chalice, sorry. Similar to that, what King has been carrying with a slightly larger crystal than he has in it that seems to be spinning and floating. And you know this to be the symphony crystals that's been protecting you. That's good to know. And uh, he would sit in, in like a corner area, maybe like with a view to the outside to just kind of read his book and keep watch in a way. Okay. Anyone else? Day one. Duran is going to be kind of perched on top of the caravan, trying to keep a lookout to make sure that, that there's nothing coming in the distance or any sinister threats over the horizon. Roll my perception check at advantage. 25. Nice. So peering off into the distance, you can see quite a bit of activity. You see a herd of nightmarish horses running around, but they're not near you. They're off into the distance. You see other strange creatures of demonic natures walking around. But if they do get close, they promptly run away once they get in contact, you assume, with the uh, symphony. Have anything to do on day one? Uh, yeah, I would spend probably like half the day walking and then also at some point riding shotgun with Glem. I'm there, but if you keep talking to him, I'm going to be like, I need to focus more. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, and this is getting to the really good part. I'm going to go in the back, and then I'll go in the back and crawl, and then see Horatio and just, like, nod at him, and then, like, get back to my book in the back of the caravan. Before uh, he starts reading, he's like, oh, I see you're almost done with it. Yeah, just a few chapters left, and it's been really good. I've been learning a lot, and I hope to show you guys some of the things I've picked up. Some of it is applicable to battle, but most of it will be in courts and in speaking with people, I'm sure. Well, I mean, you're a king, right? So you need to be good at that. That's good. Yeah, now I have a few quotes and some good references 
and good examples to to use to look from. Anyway, let me get back to this. For sure. Yeah. Back to my book as well. All right. Cal, were you doing anything specific with Glim? Yeah, I wanted to kind of chat with him for a minute. And I asked him, so who's your buyer in Arrowwatch? He kind of looks over to you and says, I'm not selling anything, that's what you're asking. This is to protect our borders. I've been commissioned. Oh, well, that sounds very noble of you. Well, of course it is. I do what I can for my people here in Shiverin. I am loyal to Queen Camilla and the cause. As am I. And he goes, I'm supposed to meet with one of the captains there and uh, hand over this. And then from there, they'll distribute it as they see fit. Because I know that they're planning an expedition over in the in the Dark Kingdom. And they're going to need this stuff to keep themselves protected. Well, then we'll do whatever we can to make sure we get everything over to there. And we'll make sure that this journey goes as smoothly as possible. You bet your ass you will. We're paying good money to the Seekers for this. Oh, don't worry. It's money well spent. I hope so. Some of the Queen's best men were murdered already. And the demon dancers are too busy with, you know, end of the world stuff, I'm sure. But they can't get any personnel over, so we gotta turn to the Seekers. And you know, I don't really trust you adventuring types, but... Oh, my hand has been dealt. Got no other choice. Be on your guard, but leave protection to us. Don't worry. And then I kind of head back to where everybody else is at. Okay. Anyone else have anything they want to do? We're doing day one. If not, we'll roll to see if an encounter takes place this day. You all start to pass on and take several breaks throughout the time to let the horses rest and continue again. The day passes on with no issues. Gets a bit chilly, though, as time goes on. And Glem turns and says, All right, I think we should rest here. Any of you got stuff that will keep us protected? I was told y'all had magic people. At this point, Horatio speaks up and says, uh, yeah, I, uh, I can keep us protected throughout the night. And he would look for like a comfortable location that's kind of out of the way w- under the trees and stuff. Like, just kind of, you know. How long was it from when we left in the morning till now? It's been a full day, so you left around 8 in the morning, 8, 9 o'clock at night, so 12 hours. Ooh, I'm almost done. Puts me to 45 of 48 hours. I'm going to stay up and read the last three hours and finish it at like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Actually, if it's 8, 9, so then I'll finish it around midnight. Okay. Anyone else? As Horatio, you're put, are you putting up the dome as we speak? Yes, yeah, so I begin casting uh, the resilient dome. Monaco didn't have any, she didn't go out to speak to anyone, but the whole time she seemed very worried. And um, when we rest tonight, She'll, she'll kind of sit separately from the rest of the party, even going so far as to make her own Leoman's tiny hut outside of the one that Horatio made. Okay, so you have two huts that appear within this landscape. Where would the caravan and things be? Are you do, are you putting that in the second hut and you're all staying in the first? That's a great idea, Minako. We could totally store the goods in there if you were able to make a second hut that will ensure their safety. Unfortunately, I won't be able to leave the hut but I'll be okay here tonight. And it will protect these goods. Have you permitted us to enter? Oh, I have. Fantastic. And then I'll help start, like, loading some of the car. Actually, we'll ask Glem. Glem, what, what cargo is most precious and should be stored in in these impenetrable domes? Well, well, all of it. The weapons are needed, and, and so is the crystals. We'll try and put as much as we can in. I mean, she can simply cast it in such that the radius would encompass the, the caravan itself, right? Yeah, yeah, you can. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. so she'll just do that. Oh, great. Perfect. Thanks for protecting these. She just gives you a If anyone else did want to sleep in there, though, you would probably have to sleep in the caravan because it's taking up most of this. Or there's also Horatio's empty one. But they are formed side by side and protect your entire camp. Is there anything anyone wants to do before slumber? Can we head on to the second day? Monaco does a bit. Just while she's, uh, while she's alone and sure that everyone's asleep, she lights a candle and then whispers into it, Protect me, please. These roads are dangerous and it's so similar. Be afraid. I need you. And then she'll snuff out the candle. After you snuff out the candle, your scar begins to burn a little bit. Your hands toward it and 
You hear whispering in your ear, I'll keep you protected. I won't let them do any harm to you, my love. We have much to do. And then, and after the breath leaves, you're back to yourself inside the hut. She'll spend the rest of the time just um, kind of in silence, awake. Okay. King finishes the tome of leadership and influence around the midnight hour, which isn't that late, so maybe a few people might still be up, but... As you finish reading the last page of this biography slash instructional book, feel energies going into your brain, actually. Just words and how to use them to influence others. This knowledge just forms into you. This magical energy starts to swirl around your body, kind of leaving the book and going on to you. And your skin becomes a little finer, a little shinier. Any blemishes that would have been there have dissipated. Your eyes shine a little bit brighter and your hair, the deeper hue of the color that you had. You feel more confident, more powerful inside and out. Charisma score raises to its new level. And all those around who are awake and see King, you all notice this. You can't quite put your finger on it. There's just something about him. Just, I stand up triumphantly. The swagger has improved. He seems more like a leader. Maybe he's born with it. I feel like there's this glow about me. And I'll see if anyone is around and if anyone's awake within. You know, Duran doesn't really sleep, so he'll definitely. Oh, okay. So you're right. Yeah, I'll, I'll know that. I'll go over to Duran and I'll say, cousin, cousin, I have finished the book. I feel fantastic. The knowledge of the kings and lords of past swells within me. I hope to do you proud, and I am almost born anew. And there's this, like, as Omar described, this glow about me, and I, like, sort of have, like, uh, sparkles in my eyes. Duran, while, while tranced and half, half asleep, half awake, chuckles and smiles, I always knew that you would be one to ascend to greatness, cousin. I had nothing but faith in you. I am well on my way, and I hope to continue to do you proud. And then I'll say good night, and then I'll um, go back to like my area that I was in before, and I will pull out the two platinum rings, and then I'll take the platinum ring off of my hand, and I will light one of my divine candles, not the scarlet one, and I will begin to pray and meditate over the rings, and ask for Myliki to protect those around me as she protects me and to embrace these uh, vessels as she has with the others. And I'll give her thanks and say, I hope I am making her proud as her chosen. I don't know how to describe it, but like reference the book and say like, thank you for sending that to me. And I'll, I'll say I'm sure that that was a, a gift from you as well and acknowledge that and just pray for like an hour or two, even though it might make me groggy tomorrow. I'll do that. And then after I'll blow out the candle and then head to bed. Roll me religion check. I'll use my ill Rabu for this day. Praying towards my Lucky and thinking of the ill Rabu and the, con and the connection you have to Katie as well. And Makar, he was such a good friend and power of friendship. And thinking of Makar, you reach out and pray towards Myliki and you feel her energy upon you. Now, when you feel this energy, it's more pure. Before, you felt a mixture between Myliki and, and Nyx, but now you feel just Myliki for just this moment. You kind of hear a tugging noise, your belongings, where it's coming from. You see another seed fall out of its pouch and roll towards you and then glow same green hue of Miley Key's grace. I will pick up the seed, like hug it, like close, and say, I understand. Knowing that her protection is over you and your allies. Anybody else doing anything for the evening? Do we need to stay awake in shifts, party members? We have been hired as protection. The domes are impenetrable, plus Duran and... Well, I don't know that Minako doesn't sleep, but I know that Duran doesn't sleep, so he's normally like our eyes... But should you wish to have a schedule, I believe Syl has thought that was wise to do before, and we can. I think it's only right. 
They are paying us to watch over them. I'll stay up for a while. Sill also there and says, I'll, uh, can help with the, with the watch if you need, or a few hours. I think it'd be wise if you got rest first and we had some crossover time, and then I'll head out and you can finish up the night. Agreed. Get some rest and I'll wake you up in a few hours. Cow, I can also take second watch, as I only need four hours of actual rest. And after that, I can sort of keep a good general watch. Oh, excellent. Woo! <laughs> 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 Ooh. Delegating responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you all set up your watch and your schedules. The first watch passes by, no issues. You go to wake up Sill, use the watch as well. And you as well, Duran, you awaken, no troubles. And throughout the entire night, it passes by uneventful. So morning appears. Oh, well, I just say, I say appear, but the day doesn't actually look like it changes. But you feel that it's now morning and awaken. Glem awakens first thing as well, stretches and says, all right, all right, we got to go. Up and at him, up and at him. <sighs> Cal stretches as he wakes up. Let's get him moving. Yeah, we should get up. You all get up, gather your things, taking down the domes, each of you. you he, Glem, goes back and hitches the caravan up. The horses look well rested and ready. He looks towards you. So, well, a couple more days. Let's hit it. You continue to walk again. Horatia would take this opportunity and go sit next to Glem and say, Glem, I'm sorry. I know this must be a difficult uh, subject for you, but I do have some questions about the previous attack. <sighs> what do you want to know? I, whatever you can remember, were you able to tell what kind of creatures attacked? I don't know much about demons, sorry, but just some, well, these two winged people things, I don't know, and then, and then after that, all types of demons started creeping up. It was like our, our symphony didn't, wouldn't work, they just came out of the woodworks. Yeah, so there's two winged individuals, and I want to describe them, that duo, J Jalen and Balin, I described them to him, did they probably look like that uh maybe i don't know i mean i've heard tales of creatures like this before i mean i don't know if they were a dime a dozen could be them could not true we've encountered some creatures like them before then i mean me no but uh people have no i am us as a group we have done it oh you guys were great that must mean you'll know what you're doing if they fucking come back we have some counter measures in play, yes. Great, and that's what I'm paying for. And the rest of the time, Horatio just kind of sits in silence there and just keeps a watchful eye out. Now that I'm done um, with the book and I have more freedom, I'm going to spend the day practicing riding chastity bolt. All right. Roll me an arcana check and a dexterity check. I will use my favorite by the gods to add... 2d4 to my dexterity check. My like he guide me. Oh, two 17s. Okay. Not terrible. Not okay. Double 17s. You all witness as well as King does this, but you hop upon Chastifol and begin to try to stand up and control yourself, maintaining balance and the mental fortitude needed to control staff. And it was pretty successful. You all witness a display of acrobatics from King. And you manage to get a hold on through the hours that you're practicing your ability to control this weapon. You know that if, it ne if needed be in situations, if you needed to make maneuvers with you on it in a precarious uh, situation, you will be able to have a good grip on how to. Cool. Anyone else doing anything in particular? Unless you're doing it again, I'm assuming, Monaco, your inspiring leaders would have. Yeah, she'll, I mean, she's spending most of the time just trying to keep morale high and be helpful. Uh, even though sometimes she seems a little worried about the trip, she's definitely you know, keeping that up. Uh, when she sees King for the first time, since since EJ, she, she kind of, she gives him this look and it's like, hey, I'm good. And then sort of, you know, delivers a, a dump like pizza. Oh, thank you. They're delicious. I look forward to your cooking every day. So you continue to feed everyone your delicious meals. And you all are full and sated with another, a few more kind words from Monaco for 10 minutes 
to all receive that inspiring leadership once again so you can give yourself 14 temporary hit points. Now, as the hours pass into the later of the afternoon, I need to know where everyone is stationed. Like, where are you? In the caravan, outside the caravan, at the front. So starting with uh, Cal, where are you? I'm up at the front, kind of walking alongside the caravan, trying to notice anything coming at us on the road ahead or immediately to the sides of the front of the caravan. Doran is placed closer to the back. Well, if wherever really, where is King? Because he's going to be placed somewhere where he can protect and look out for King and make sure he's safe. I'm flying on chassis folds uh, like above the caravan, about 5 to 15 feet above the caravan, doing maneuvers in the air. So then Doran will be in the back, looking out the back, making sure no threats are coming from behind, or, or that nothing's going to like pop up flying from behind. Horatio would be sitting in the front with Glenn, and he's kind of just keeping an eye out on the front and off to like their sides, like diagonally. Like, just kind of doing, like, a cone look. Okay. And Monaco? She is probably near the front just because that's where the most people are, and she's likely just either in the middle of delivering goods or is just sort of where it seems to be safest because she's super nervous about being jumped by humans. So Monaco's also outside walking? Yeah, she'll be she'll be near... She'll be next to Cal. She's, she's walking right behind them and sort of keeping close to them. Roll me... All of you, a perception check. But Cal, you've already rolled yours. Aw, oh, darn it all. <laughs> Before anything gets super crazy, each morning, once we've gotten on the road, I would have activated my crown. All right. So, Syl, Duran, and Horatio, as you are following along with this caravan, you see what seems to be a small village-like structure ahead of you. There's a smoldering fire, as well as several little huts or tents. There doesn't seem to be anyone around, though, and it's empty. Pull up on the map. Uh, you can place yourselves in the order that you're in. So, Duran, you were on top of the caravan, you said? He was, like, more towards, like, hanging back of the caravan. So, as you walk ahead, you see this, at least the three of you, notice you're coming upon a small camp structure with smoldering flames and tents put about. There's gathered wood as well as boats and things that you would lead that they're probably hopping to the nearby river to use, but not a soul to be found. Curious, do the flames seem like they were recently lit? Uh, you can go over to them and roll a survival check or an investigation check. I will investigate the fires. Duran says as he hops off the back of the caravan, he's going to run and make a survival check. This doesn't look good. Horatio begins casting mage armor and says to Glum. Be careful. Maybe you should find somewhere to hide. Um, yeah, if you say so. And he goes and he jumps into the back of the caravan. Glem, have these always been here? This camp always here? He goes, um, I'm not sure. We don't always take the same path. Oh, wait, what? What the hell? Um, guys, someone, something weird's happening back here. Uh, weird how? It, 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 the, the crystal. I'll go down and look at it fly in. Okay. Duran, you look at the flames and you can see that they were, yes, recently lit and they're going out at this point. But someone must have been here not too long ago. Maybe 10, 15 minutes? Half an hour at most? These fires are fresh. You said the crystal is... King, looking behind as you go into the caravan, you open up the flaps and see Glem sitting next to the crystal as it floats on the chalice. But the tint of it, it seems to be slowly, not dimming, it's still bright, but darkening almost. Oh no. And it looks like it might have, a good chunk of it has been, has been slowly darkening. And none of you have noticed, and now you, King, you release your senses and you notice now the aura that has been protecting you has been slowly shrinking. They're counter-charming the crystal. There's something tainting our symphony. I'll shout out. And you all kind of hear a, <laughs> I say, get ready for an attack. And I look around to see if there's anybody planning to ambush us right now. Uh, coming forth from invisibility, you see forming up two bat-like 
humanoid creatures that you've uh, been all too familiar with. Their laugh cackling throughout the air. And you hear suddenly this, a strange sound of, of strings and instruments bursting throughout the air. <laughs> <laughs> Infecting the well with doom and plight. Crushing the weak with all our might. Sowing the seeds of hatred and contempt. When the supreme ruler, our orders are sent. Balin! Jalen. Demons of the Dark Kingdom, maim and kill. We'll gobble you up until we've had our fill. And appearing, you see a strange yellow demon popping out. Quasit! Look what we have here, Balin. Ooh, they look familiar. Why, yes, it's those twerps we saw before in Small Point. Now, now, we don't want to take another licking, do you? Hand us over the crystal that we know you have. Wait, is there two I sense? What do you need the crystals for? That's none of your concern. Now, if you don't want to end up like mincemeat, you will calmly hand over the symphony. It's already in our clutches anyway. Not if we have anything to do with this. Oh, well, well, well. Does the little pipsqueak think he can do something? We all do. Yeah. Oh, it looks like you have more friends. No matter. We'll stomp you, won't we? Yes, we will. They don't have those pesky demon dances to save them this time. And they kind of fly. They're about, I will say, 80 feet above in the air yelling at you, but they are they kind of fly up closer towards you. Um, you're noticing that they're well within the perimeter of what would, of the uh, Crystal Symphony. Now, are you going to be good? Or do we have to get rough? As he asks that question, I say, well, I don't know. Right now we have a job to complete. And then he starts uh, muttering some arcane words and he casts Conjure Minor Elemental. Looking at them after they said that and as Horatio is conjuring his elemental, I'll say, you are in our domain and what land I walk through, I sanction in her grace. This is Milaki's land and I call a guardian of faith. And I point to the front of the caravan and a spectral tree starts to grow out of the ground and appear and it radiates an aura that any a hostile creature within 10 feet of it must make a dexterity saving throw and then they'll take damage. 20 damage if they fail, 10 on a half, and it will stay there until it deals a total of 60 damage. So you're all within this camp that you're not sure what happened. Uh, the two succubi, Balin and Jalen, that you met before, but they appear before you, seemingly trying to get to your crystals that are playing the symphony. The symphony you see is slowly starting to change shade and become darker, King, when from the back. King, you create this large tree-like structure that springs out and protects everyone around you. Um, they take notice of this as, Horatio, you begin to cast your ability to summon the elemental beings. With your enemy a foot ahead of you, Monaco, you start the round. What do you do? Monaco kind of, she's got this, ever since we walked into the situation, she had this look of fear on her face, but she sort of swallows it and um, takes a step out from behind Cal. And she'll pull out well, she's got in her hand a uh, this, the, the rod that she used earlier with the, the little bit of paper on it. And she will tap the paper at the end of the rod to her book that's hanging off her belt and sort of pull away from it. And as she does so, there's a sort of black stream coming from it, like ink on paper. And she, she writes out uh, something in Infernal and uh, casting as she does so. The word she actually writes out is befuddlement. And she'll cast synaptic static on them. Okay, what's the range on that? It is 120 feet. Yep, so you can do that. Is it more than one creature or just one? It's a 20 foot radius sphere. Okay. Connected. What role do I have to make? It's an intelligence saving throw, DC 18. So the Quasit failed, but Balin passed and Jalen. So the Incubus failed and the Succubus passed and the Quasit passed, uh, failed. So go ahead and roll your damage. And what everyone sees is she writes this word out in front of them. And then for a brief moment, 
around them, there's this sort of an area of distortion in the air, and um, all of them are sort of stricken with this psychic energy. And as your psychic energy strikes them, they're just like, oh, ah! And the quasi's like, quasi! And it disperses into dust. And uh, Balin looks over to you and says, um, do you know how difficult it is to come in these things and train them? Ugh. Oh, I'll get you. After after that, she kind of just runs a little bit, taking a couple steps to get behind Cal and between, sort of in this radius um, of the tree in Mexico, but otherwise passes down. All right. You uh, shoot off your psychic energy, inflicting it upon the enemies in front of you. The quasi disperses, and you see them take, um, you see the succubi take a hit as well before Balin begins to flap her wings to go higher. All right, so Balin takes her turn. The succubus begins to fly up, and she goes, We've learned from last time! <laughs> ah, the real trouble will begin now! And she pulls out a necklace from underneath what she's wearing, it seems. And this silver-colored necklace, she snaps with her fingers. And you see appearing behind all of you. So next to Cal and, and um, King this magic circle appearing, this demonic magic circle up here down there. You see claws start to pull out of the ground as it begins to shake. And first you see... Could this be counterspell? Roll me intelligence check. When you looked upon and started doing it, you saw that she used some type of item and her not being the cast of the item, you know it cannot be counterspelled. So you see appearing out of the ground from the circle, this grotesque creature pulling itself up with this clawed, dark hands. It looks like a mockery of what would be an ape or a boar, standing twice the height of a normal person, pulling itself and standing up with feathered wings coming out from its back that seem too small for its bloated, gorilla-like body until stepping upon its pig-like hooves, this monstrous demon with tusk coming out from its double chin uh, and its ape-like face roaring at you, shouting something in a language that you don't understand unless someone understands a pistol. Balin goes, ha, 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 let's see you take on this one. And no demon dances to save you now. All right, Jalen, concentrate. Complete the song so we may get the next verse. Indeed. She ends her turn. Horatio, you're up next. Horatio, seeing the they want to play Sky Games, started summoning a ice elemental but switches his mind and you guys start noticing the wind kind of start to pick up and swirl and it starts to pick up and swirl behind Jalen and suddenly a face forms in the wind and I summon an air elemental. So it wouldn't actually appear. You have to spend 10 rounds casting this. Well, that's why I wanted to cast it before the combat started, but it's fine. Yeah, it would not uh, uh, one. You only get one action before it started, and it would only be six seconds at that. So you actually would not be able to do this unless you. Mm, no, nah, he would. He would not do that. He would instead. Yeah, he would uh, move. He would misty step with his bonus action. Oh no! Wait, they're up in the air, right? Yes, they're in the air. And then there's the giant demon that appeared behind you. Right. So yeah, no, that changed my plans up. So I'm just going to for now. Horatio's going to run 15 feet just to not be a target. He's going to cast greater invisibility on himself. Okay. All right. So seeing Bailey and Jalen and the demon appearing, you run away to make give yourself distance and cast your invisibility spell going out of view. Anything else you'd like to do? You still have the rest of your movement and your bonus action. I would run here to Duran and I'll whisper to Duran and say, I heard her say, for Jalen to focus, he should be our target. And that's my turn. Awesome. Good. Duran is going to nod at the information that her just gave him. And you said they're 80 feet in the air? Yes. How high is this building next to us, this tent? The tent's about 10 feet. Is it feasible for Duran to run up the side of the tent, hop, and then jump off the tent and throw a dart at long range at Jalen? Roll me an intelligence check. Also, what's your range on darts? Dart long range is 60. Okay. Seven. You can try. 
He might have disadvantage, but if he can sneak Jalen before... Uh, fuck it. <sighs> fuck it. He's gonna pull out his his bow and arrow, and he's gonna just run up and take a shot at Jalen. All right, take your attack. So as long as you can reach him from the 80 feet in the air, your shot. Does your tree do anything that blocks vision or anything like that? It's a completely spectral tree. Oh, spectral. Okay, just making sure. It's actually supposed to be a shield, but I flavored it as a tree. Oh, I actually thought it was a tree. Okay, that's fine. So do I make your attack? It's within normal range, so since I'm attacking before he's had a chance to attack or act yet, I get, I get, um, triggers my assassin ability. Okay. All right, that's a hit. Roll damage. I'm going to blow one of my combat dice to force a DC 16 strength save on top of this. 17? Oh, 17 now. DC 17 strength uh, check. And let me roll my damage here. All right, I'll roll the strength check. All right, he rolled a natural 20. All right, so you left forth your first arrow and it lands Jalen right into his wing. It begins to, to pull him down as the force of the arrow starts to take its effect, but he managed to hit it off, keeping his altitude. Okay, well, using my fighter feature, second attack, I take the second attack I get. Take your second attack. All right, that is a hit. Roll damage. And I make him take another DC 17 strength check. Okay. Uh, he passes this as well. Though I won't say how much unless somebody wants to do something since everyone has something they can do. Uh, then I action surge and then I attack him again. Natural 20. Oof. That's awesome. It's a double crit. <laughs> I forced him to make the same DC 17 check. I kid you not, I rolled a natural 20 again. Uh, and then he attacks one last time. And that's another hit. Roll that damage. Is this tent over here open? Uh, all the tent doors are open, or flaps are open, that you can enter if you wish. Awesome. Duran is going to use the rest of his movement, moving over to this tent, and using his um, bonus action to use the hide feature to hide inside the tent after firing off the last arrow. So he kind of fires the arrow and then dives backwards into a tent after he shoots it. All right, after uh, firing a volley of arrows, one after another, they all managed to hit the incubus straight in the wings and chest. And he's like, oh, oh, oh. And but he, with every strike, he managed to keep himself composed and, and, and then breathing heavier and heavier. You see him getting ready to do something, like taking a deep breath. But uh, and then afterwards, running into the tent, keeping yourself guarded and protected. Um, you do look around and you notice uh, the tent inside are dead bodies. Tiefling dead bodies, people clad in armor. Duran is horrified at this, but he says nothing because he's hiding. All right. Uh, roll me a stealth check at advantage. Okay, you are well hidden within there, although appalled by the scene of gore you see before you. Up next is going to be Jalen. Jalen is going to say, Sister, please. Do something. And he'll fly up 20 more feet just to make it to 100. And he, and he shouts down, This is the furthest I can be! You all hear him take a deep breath and go, And continue that. And he, he spends his entire turn saying, saying these strange words that all sound disgusting and irritate the hell out of you. And he's going to end his turn with that. King, you're up next. How close is this other creature next to us? Is it... How high off the ground? Because I'm it's, about... It came, it came out of the ground, and the creature's pretty tall, so I'll say it's about 10 feet, 10, 15 feet tall. Okay, so I'm, like, eye level with it, since I'm, like, floating 15 feet off the air. Okay. I'm going to use the disengage action and sort of back paddle away from the creature, so that way it doesn't get a swing at me, and then I'll, like, fly around the caravan like this, getting a little bit closer to the ground, and I'll get here more towards the base of my uh, spectral tree. And uh, when I'm here, I'll actually land and hold Chastifold out in front of me, and then I'll start to spin it, and I'll call forth a Chastifo. So I'll call forth a Chastifo, and a spectral version of my flower spear will appear, and I'm going to cast it at a level four. Uh, let me see how far I can cast it away. I can cast it 60 feet away, and then I can move it another 20. So I don't think I can get it within range. 
So I'll summon it behind this creature and attack. All right, roll your attack. Mm. Miss. You make a first strike with your spiritual weapon, and unfortunately it misses this large... Well, actually, it hits the large creature, but it bounces off his strange armor of feathers and fur. I'll say, it's quite powerful! And that was my action bonus. All right. So... Uh, moving out the way and summoning Chasifold, you attempt to strike at it, but unfortunately can't get past his hide. Up next is Sill. So we're going to have Sill go after the flying creatures. Is that what you guys... I'll let you guys decide what you want Sill to do. You want to attack the demon or attack the incubus and succubus? I mean, he can fly. He should go for the air people. Yeah, he always takes it to the skies. Okay. So he can use a step of the wind and get there. So we'll have him blow a key for that and take the bonus action to fly on up so he can reach them. Would you like to go after Balin or Jalen? Jalen. The one with the the mouse. All right. So Syl flies on up and soars his way, flying towards Jalen. He's going to make his, with his Warden of the Skies, his attack, or Sky Warden. Uh, It's a (laughs) dive, though. He's not diving at it, so it doesn't count. Yeah, no, he has to dive. He has to dive. Okay. So he'll just normally attack. So we'll just do his first attack. Action. Battle act. And a hit anyway. Use his second attack. A hit. And 13 damage. But he will expend a key point to see if he can do a stunning strike. Make the creature fall to the ground. And roll a constitution save on. And that is a 12. So as Sil strikes with his battle axes, one after another on the incubus, who's chanting this weird abyssal song almost, he strikes it directly into his chest, and you hear, Ooh! and the song stops, and he begins to fall into the ground. After a few seconds, he lands, taking quite a bit of fall damage, taking 12 points of fall damage. After a moment, now he's within the range of my guardian of faith. Mm-hmm the spectral tree will start to pulse with energy and a warm, radiant glow will pulse out and hit it and he will have to make a dexterity save of 17. Well, he automatically fails since he is stunned. Then he takes 20 radiant damage. 20 radiant damage. Here we go. Oof. You hear, Jalen, no! As Jalen falls drawn to the ground, stunned by Sil's strike and into this spectral tree. He kind of falls and crashes amongst the ethereal branches. He lands into the ground, taking both falling and radiant damage. Unable to speak in pain, but you can see it in his eyes as he's stunned onto the ground. And that'll end Sil's turn. Up next, Cal. Alright. I am going to take one of my magical revolvers and fire off a shot at the large demon right in front of me. That is a 13, and that misses. So you you fire your first shot from your pistol, and it goes wide past this demon as it roars at you. Yeah, I'm going to try it again. Would I know if this is a fiend or not? Since I do know it's like an obviously like a demon-like creature. Yeah, you know it's a fiend. You, you're from Frostmoor. You're, you're familiar enough with demons to be able to tell what a fiend is. Excellent. 18, that's a hit. Roll damage. And as I uh, let loose this bullet from my revolver, I scream, he who shoots with his hand has forgotten the face of his god, and I'm going to add a divine smite to it. Hey, nice. And then I also get an additional d8 because it is a fiend. Two, so I'll add two more to his damage. And that's all radiant damage as well. And then for my bonus, I'm going to use my ability to fire another round at it. All right, go right ahead. And I'm also going to Divine Smite it again. Oof, seven more. All right, what else would you like to do in the rest of your turn? So Balin or Jalen is on the ground? Jalen. Jalen's on the ground prone? Yes. And Balin is still 80 feet up in the air? Yes. All right, uh, that's all I'm going to do for the turn. All right. So you all see Cal pull out his magical pistols and begin shooting off rounds one after another. One miss, uh, but changing his trajectory, he's able to slide in close quarters and begin firing point blank at this demon, taking several hits and releasing a torrent of what you all witness to be radiant energy coming from these holy pistols. 
Um, they strike the demon as it roars in pain and agony, stepping back slightly before putting his feet back together and roaring into your face. Excellent. Up next is the creature. So, getting the creature's attention, Cal, he looks towards you and with his undeniably bad stench. He goes and makes a claw attack against you, raising up his bird-like talons and slashing down. Ooh. The 16, which hits. Oh, yes, it does. Maliki uh, protects him. And I'll use my reaction and two sorcery points to reduce the incoming attack by a d4. Oh, maybe it still hits then. What's your AC? Uh, 14. Still hits. Yeah. So it's a 15, so it still hits, yeah. Damn it! <laughs> Sorry, I tried. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, so you take 12 points of slashing damage, but most of it has been absorbed by the charismatic words of Monaco, this temporary hit point shielding you. Oof. Thanks, Monaco. I don't... That thing's pretty rough. Don't look away from it. And as you do, <laughs> another slash comes your way. That's a 26 versus your AC. Uh, yeah. Another 17 points of damage, partially absorbed by the words of Monaco. Uh, but you are fully exposed now and taking extra damage on top of that. He gets one <sighs> more attack with his bite. Now he comes in to take a chunk out of you. That's a 12. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't hit. Yeah. The bite goes in and you instinctively jump back out of the way, dodging it as this huge behemoth of a creature. Well, it's only a large creature, but <laughs> comes down upon you trying to take a bite out of Cal. Lastly, after he finishes, you, he releases a large roar as all of you hear that. Everyone who is within a 15-foot radius, so that would be King, Cal, Monaco, and that's it. The rest of you are just out of sight of his reach. I need you all to make me a wisdom saving throw. Uh, Monaco and King, you also get plus 40 or saving throw. Jesus. Hmm. Can't save myself. So everyone but Cal passes as this roar comes, uh, erupts from this beast. Uh, you will feel frightening presence upon you. You instinctively want to run away, but the aura from the, pal from the paladin in front of you gives you strength and you hold your ground. Unfortunately, it does not work for you, Cal, and you are immediately <laughs> frightened of this creature in front of you. So you have the frightened effect. You don't have to move away, run away from it at this moment, but all your uh, attacks against it are disadvantage. You have a disadvantage on all ability tech and attack rolls while the source of the fear is within sight. And you cannot willingly move any closer to this creature. That doesn't mean you don't have to you have to move away from it. Okay. You last for one minute and at the end of each of your turns, you can make another wisdom saving throw. The rest of you can no longer be affected by such a uh, feat since you have succeeded. But with that, the creature ends its turn ready to take another chunk out of this next victim. Top of the round is Monaco. So Monaco is sort of engaging with this unidentified creature, hiding almost behind Cal, and she sees the look of fear in his face, and she stands up um, tall for a second, and then grabs her rod and kind of taps it against her book, and then just lets out a couple slashing motions with it, leaving these sort of black streaks in the air. She does, um, and she will cast Eldritch Blast. On the unidentified creature. That's a hit. Roll that damage. Oof. The next is a hit as well, though not as strong. So, Monaco, you fire two Eldritch Blasts, and this dark arcane torrent strikes the beast, and you hear... Mm -hmm. What else do you like to do? And then she will retreat. <laughs> All right. As you retreat, you see this creature reach around... Cal, in, you, with his long arms, and grab you and attempts to take a strike. So it's going to take an opportunity attack against you. It's a 15 versus your AC. Yes, she, she does not have the ability to dodge 15. Okay. So you take 19 points of slashing damage that you absorb with your shielding. Um, but you do take some damage as your kimono gets slightly ripped from the claws and make your way across. So you can continue your movement where you like to go. And that's it. All right. Up next is Balin. 
seeing Jalen on the ground, he she looks down and goes, Ugh, can't count on you for anything. Get away from my brother. And he, she will fly down just close enough so she gets about 30 feet uh, above Sill and goes, run away. Leave him alone. You don't want to fight him. And bats her, her succubus eye. And he has to make a wisdom saving throw, which is he's really good at. So not today, though. So looks on and locks eyes with the succubus. And for a second, the tension in his shoulders and his hand drops. And he looks dumbfounded and says, "Ah, uh, OK, I'll leave him alone. Good, good. Now get up and hurry. And she ends her turn using that charm effect. Duran, you're up next. So that big effect that the unidentified creature did. It didn't affect you. You were away, too far away from it. Okay, awesome. I know Horatio told me to prioritize taking down the dude, but he's not going to leave Cal there to fight the demon basically on his own. If Duran were to try to run over into the caravan while still stealth, run through it, and then hop out, and then surprise hit the thing in the face, would he get advantage for that? Or would that just be just a cinematically cool thing to do? My apologies. So it would be a cinematic thing, to, but you can go up behind it and uh, get flanking for what Cal is. Yeah, then that's what Duran is going to do. He's going to dive out of the tent and then come from behind the caravan. And then once he comes around, while he's running, he's going to grip his new blade and he's going to swing it up into the unidentified creature's flank. All right. So as you make your way out of the tent, hopping behind the caravan, or behind the creature, getting a, a flanking position so you can easily strike, make your attacks at advantage. Okay, 22. So this item does not give you the plus one that Firethorn does, but still manages to hit regardless. So as you take out this new weapon and release it from its uh, bindings, you notice that now that you're attuned to it, it's more in control. Although the weapon's not itself magical, it's almost like the force itself that's upon it has a magical sense to it. Not being able to make heads or tails, you continue with your slash going through the creature with much force. Your 10 points of damage uh, halved because you notice that this creature seems to heal back its the mundane wounds since it's not magical. Duran's going to strike again because... That's how his fighting style is. So he's going to keep moving with the momentum from his first swing and then All right, that's another hit. With your second strike down, it seems to be even stronger than the last. The, the momentum and the power coming from this blade seeming to increase with every strike. Go ahead and make your next attack. 27. Roll that damage. Now you continue on with the onslaught of slashes. Uh, each one increases at the speed further and further. You all witness a blur of strikes from Duran as he's striking the creature. The creature kind of grrr, roars in pain at your torrent of hits. What else do you want to do? As the momentum from all the uh, subsides, Duran kind of braces from the new weight of the blade and stops himself and then he just gets into a fighting stance and ends his turn. All right. After you finish uh, what your slash is, you, the energy that you feel that was picking up slowly starts to die down and you don't feel that force from your slashes once again, feeling that you might need to pick up the momentum to increase its strength like you did before. So that may give you a hint on how the blade works. But up next is Horatio. Invisible behind the flames, you see your ally strike out at the demon as well as Balin and Jalen in their positioning. What do you decide to do next? Horatio is going to run over right here next to Monaco. And Minako is going to notice these arcane kind of just purple bolts fly out of just an area right next to her. And they're going to hit Jalen, who's on the ground. And I'm casting a magic missile at level... I'll cast it at level one. That's 3d4, right? Yep. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be 11 total. Okay. And as it hits... As they come out, uh, Monaco here is, we have to take him out. He's the one counteracting the symphony. And then he's going to continue his movement by going back to the area he was at. Or, or can I see the the unidentified creature? You can see it around the corner easily. Yeah, do I recognize it? Roll me an 
intelligence check. God damn it. You're not really sure. You read a lot of demons and this one might not have come up in from what you've read so far. And, uh, that is Horatio's turn. All right. Jalen goes. So Jalen's going to use half. Stunned. Oh, that's right. He is stunned. So he... Oh, so he automatically fails his deck save and takes full 20 radiant damage. At the, is that the start, start of his turn? So this is when they enter and the start of his turn? Yep. Ooh. Okay. All right. The spectral tree slowly gathers energy and pulses again and radiates the energy. And because he cannot dodge or get out of the way, he fully takes the brunt of it. it takes 20. At the end of his turn, he's like, Oh, sister, I'm hurt. Do something. And he ends his turn. King, you're up next. I am going to wave my hands and make a few motions and have Chastifo Chastifo fly towards the unidentified creature again and try and smash into it. Weapon. Make that attack. That's a 25. Phew. That hits. Roll damage. All right. Chastifo slams directly into the beast, piercing its large stomach. And you just hear a roaring sound. <laughs> As it just ejects itself and some of its black ichor starts to spew out. And then I will hold actual Chastifal out to, and aim it towards the incubus on the ground. And I will say, you have been judged. Sunflower! And it will like bloom quickly and open and you'll see like energy particles gather in. And then this radiant energy will blast out towards Jalen. And I will cast it at a second level of Sacred Flame. No, not Sacred Flank. Uh, guiding Bolt. Let me target him. You miss. I'm going to... This is the start of my turn again. Oh, no. I'm going to use my Il Rabu bonus. I'll add my plus eight. There's a 18 hit. 18 hits. Perfect. Okay. So... Oh, what a garbage roll. And also the next attack against it. He has a, a glowing pollen surrounding him. And it sort of lights him up. And the next attack against him grants advantage. You got it. What else do you want to do? That's my um, bonus main action. I will stand my ground. All right. So you stand your ground there, uh, looking on you. Use Chastifal to strike the demon and uh, use your guiding bolt and then strike the other incubus onto the ground, dealing some damage. He's still alive, but he looks definitely hurt. So Sil thinks hard and goes into his quiet place before taking a deep breath. He looks over and says, "Ah, that's not going to work on me. And he draws his weapon. He will use his bonus action to attack at advantage Jalen on the ground. It's a hit. We have, yep, he'll spend another key point. Three to do another stunning strike. So, the saving throw. All right. This time, he takes his hammer after stealing his mind and slams it down onto the fallen incubus, releasing his key to stun his body. Jalen reacts and stretches out his wings, able to push back the stunning force. <sighs> no, not again. Sil will not move and hold his ground. Up next is Cow. So you're frightened of the creature, but you, you can choose, so you don't have to run away. Uh, but all your attacks against him will be at disadvantage, or against anyone, to be honest. So what do you do next? Question, after reading my ability properly, would a 15 have saved me? Yes. Okay. Then I should have been not frightened. Okay. Because I had my charisma to it, which would have made it a 15 total. And with the flanking, would we have advantage on attacks against this thing anyways? Uh, yes, you would. So I'll remove the frightened. Say you're able to stave it off when it comes to your turn. You realize, looking deep inside, there's nothing to fear. It's just an emotion. Emotion that you can set aside and snapping out of it, you strike at advantage, because you see your ally behind him, the large beast. Yes. So I am going to take my other revolver and fire away at this beast with that one as well. All right, go right ahead. First one is a miss. You shoot a bullet and it manages to... It hits the, the shoulder part of it, in which it seems to be encased in all this fur and shelling, and it manages to bu- uh, shoot off the, the bullet. Kind of. Deflect. Deflect the bullet, yes. Oof. All right, I'm going to try it again. Oh, well, that works. And I'm going to actually do a second level Divine Smite. Okay. And I'm going to use my bonus action to hit it again. All right, go right ahead and take your next shot. 
I will release this one with a level two Divine Smite as well. And I say with this one, he who kills with his gun has forgotten the face of their god. I kill with my heart. Unleashing that bullet, a radiant light empties from the barrel. After missing the first shot, you release another torrent of shots one after another, striking with your pistols this demon in the chest. Every time he takes a step back, but unable to as Duran is holding his back, you know, keeping him at bay as he's just striked uh, one by one by your bullets. He seems to be panting heavily at you and looking side to side. He looks soft to go ahead and reach at both of you. Anything else you want to do before the end of your, at the end of your turn? Yeah, I'm going to look at this thing panting. And do I still have like a bonus action? No. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. No, I use my bonus action because that was the third shot. The first one missed, the next two hit. So that'll that'll be my my move. I'm gonna stay where I'm at and kind of hold my ground because I want Doran to be able to continue flanking as well. Okay. So Lukita will look around and see that it's surrounded and kind of smile eerily. He will once again release his horror torrent, his, the smoke coming out of him this time. All those that passed don't have to worry, but Duran, since you're within it, I need to roll me a wisdom saving throw. Abanai. Oh. You are frightened. Or do you get plus something from... No, because he's more than 10 feet away from me. Mm, okay. So you are frightened and cannot move any closer and at disadvantage when attacking anything when this creature is in your vision. Now he's going to use his movement to use an ability. As he kind of stares and smiles at both of you, you just see a poof, and he goes invisible, disappears. Appearing in between where near uh, Balin and Jalen, King and Monaco, is the beast, seemingly to teleporting his way out of trouble. Dexterity saving throw. All right. And because it's invisible, it doesn't do any opportunity attacks. Wow. Duran is like covered in sweat once he gets feared by the creature, bracing and getting ready to see where his next attack comes from. And once he disappears and reappears, completely off guard, looking left and right, trying to get his bearings, help us to be able to help them. Okay, he fails his check and takes on a bludgeoning amount of radiant damage as he steps into this uh, ability, and he's going to strike at King first. And then the spectral tree fades away, all of its energy has been expensed. Ah. It it does 60 points of damage and then disappears. All right, attack number one. He's going to attack with his claw. All right. 18 versus your AC. Uh, that hits. 13 points of damage. He's going with a second attack, which also hits. Slash on you. Yeah, I have only a 15 AC. And lastly, he's going to end with a bite on you. 26. Just misses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 31 points of... Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> smashes into me. Horatio would use his reaction. Actually, let me see how far... Yeah, King is within 30 feet of me because I got... And I would absorb 23 points of that damage. So the creature teleports itself towards King, seeing him, for whatever reason, drawn to him and begins to make slashes. You look into his eyes and see there is some sort of intelligence from this barbaric creature and makes the slashes and claws its way at you before diving into your shoulder and taking a chunk. There is this abjuric shield that appears around that area and you look back and uh, you can't see it, but you sense the energy being pulled away from you that would do the damage onto your ally being in battle with him several times before. Horatio, thanks. I have no idea where it came from because he's... <laughs> right? I just think to myself. Okay, top of the round, Monaco. She kind of looks up at this giant thing next to her, appeared out of nowhere, not pleased with that situation. She, she, she looks like she's going to take a couple steps back and then remembers that last time she did that, she got, she got slashed at. So she's going to hold her ground and just unleash another one of those sets. Or, actually, it's a ranged attack. When you're in melee, is that a thing in this one? What was that? What was the question? Uh, she's a, when you attack someone in melee with a ranged attack, you have disadvantage. Disadvantage, yes. Yeah, just making sure. So, actually, she will run away. <laughs> so, yeah, she, she sees this big thing coming, and before before even thinking tactically, fear overtakes her, and she, she, she takes ten feet or so to run, and then you know, takes her takes her rod and unleashes another torrent of inky black magic. Roll your attack. 
First one is a hit. 15 damage. Second one is a hit as well. For 10 damage. 25 damage in total. So once again, two Eldritch Blast <laughs> flies out of your hand, slamming this beast right into its face. It goes, Ugh, and looks over at you, trying to reach you, but you manage to duck and dive out of its way uh, when you release these torrents. What else do you want to do? You saw the rest of your movement? Yeah, uh, she could move, but she will not. That's it. Okay. Next up is Balin, who's going to look over and say, Ah, come on, let him handle this. I'm going to get you out of here. Continue the song. So she manages to scoop up Jalen and begin to fly off. Still is going to take a opportunity attack. Do you want him to take it against Balin or Jalen? The almost a dead one. Jalen. Uh, yeah. Who natural one. Uh, he goes with his vicious warhammer, but Balin is too quick and he misses, striking nothing but air. You hear say, sucker. And start to pull the incubus and herself up. So she's only going to go about 40 feet in the air. So same spot, just 40 feet in the air. And Jalen begins to start to use his wings to fly as well on his own strength. She's going to end her turn there. Seemingly like standing in front of her brother. Just hurry up. Duran, take your turn. Duran, unfortunately, frightened closer to it. Can't really help. Feels like he can't help, but he remembers that he's not alone and he has the help of his friends. Even when it comes to helping his friends, he feels a small trickle of magic coming from the ring on his right hand and focusing on the memories of King and Chasterfold. He puts out his fist and he yells, come forth, spiritual weapon! And he's going to summon a chaster foe put inside of the ring by King about, uh, what's the radius for spiritual weapon? Well, it's not a radius, it's just some attack roll with it? Just summon yeah. it. it. Well, you can use your bonus action. You can summon it within 60 feet, I believe, and then use it to... Oh, sorry, I thought I unmuted. Yeah, you're right. 60 feet, and then you can move it 20 feet as a a bonus, bonus on your turn, and it's 1d8 plus 7. Sorry, 1d8 plus 6. Let's see, 60 feet. So, is it possible to summon that near Jalen and Balin? You can summon and then use your bonus to have it get all the way up there, so yes. Or why can't he just run forward a little bit and then cast? He can't run any forward. He can't move closer towards the demon, because he's fine. Uh... So he summons the ring with his mind, just keeping those memories... And focusing on those memories and that link with King, he summons the Chastafo and sends it to the demons. All right, Chastafo appears, so there's two, and makes his way up towards Balin and Jalen. You can use your bonus action to make an attack against one of them, if so choose. He uses his bonus action to make it a take a... Wait, does he have to move it with his bonus action? It moves and attacks. Awesome. Attacking um, Jalen. All right. I roll a d20 plus six. All right, 18. So that's going to hit. How much damage does your chest of do? 1d8 plus 6. Or one, actually 5, because that's when I cast it. 1d8 plus 5. Okay, so 8 damage. Yeah. He's still alive, but he is looking very beat up. He's like, Ugh, sister, do something. What else do you want to do? Or Horatio, what are you doing? Simultaneously. I have a question. So from where Horatio is currently standing at, if I casted a line ability spell, does the... Demon get targeted. Aiming it. If you're trying to get all of them, you will not be able to, like, arc it up and hit them. Yeah, so he would prioritize the two running away. So that's the distance they are ground level, plus 40. They're both within 100 feet. So he's going to cast Lightning Bolt at them. And I believe one is being held by the other, right? Yeah, they're sharing the same space right now. Ish. Yeah. They have to make a deck saving throw, but... Uh, so they both failed. So they both take... Horatio would move quietly to that location and Monaco again sees just and just magic pop out of <laughs> the air and a huge lightning bolt flies and hits both. Okay, so as you conjure your lightning ability, you shoot it forth, shocking both of the ink, the succubi. Uh, you seem to go uh, and after the smoke clears, see their hair is standing on end. Balin looks down and says, you fool! You can see it, can't you? Get the wizard! He's around there somewhere. And the beast kind of turns around and locks eyes with you directly and smiles. What do you do next? You still have your movement? Your bonus? Yeah, with that, Horatio is going to do 
I still got 10 feet of movement, so he's gonna go one, two, to go right here to kind of use the tent to break line of sight with him. And that is his turn. All right. Up next is Jalen. Jalen is going to use all of his movement to go up to 100 feet above. He goes, I'm almost done. Protect me, sister. He's going to use his entire action to sing this abyssal song. You're not unsure what it's doing exactly. And that ends his turn. King, you're up next. I will say, I will not let you. And I will jump on the chassis fold and start to fly up towards them. The creature already took its reaction, so I'm assuming I can fly out of range easily because I saw it strike at Minako before. And I'll fly like up here, like 40 feet into the air. And I will start making uh, hand motions and charge up Chassifold and the bulbous tip is start to bloom and grow with energy and it's gathering strength again. And I aim it towards Jalen and I cast. So, you know, at your level next to you is also the succubus, uh, Balin. She's not up with him. She stayed lower because she had to use her movement. So you'll have to deal with her being right in front of you if you want to do that. Yeah, I'll fly like here. So I'm just up in the air and not like super far away. Actually, fine. Now you said something that triggered me. Okay. <laughs> I'm only going to fly up like 10 feet. So I'm still more than 60 feet away from them. I'm like 70 feet away. And then I will still charge and gather the energy of Chassifold. And I will launch a guiding bolt at level three <laughs> towards Balin because... It has a range of 120. So the energy starts to grow and gather, and I launch the attack towards him. So I hit, roll damage. So the energy smashes into him. Radiant energy crashes into his body, and this like golden like smoke sort of envelops around him, and it is a familiar pollen, and it lights him up and makes him uh, glow and radiate. And the next attack against him will also be at advantage. And I guess a longer... No, I don't have a cantrip that's uh, long enough range to reach them. So for my bonus action, I'll look back towards chest of foe and do a quick hand motions and move it 5, 10, 15, 20 feet closer um, and preparing it for, for battle for next round. And then I'll move... Uh, end my turn, I mean. Okay. So after shooting your brilliant blast of radiant energy, Jalen's looking pretty hurt still chanting whatever he's saying. He remains in the air, but his wings look beat up and he's starting to lose altitude and Balin looks worried. Sil's going to fly on after him, but he was on the ground. Let me just make sure Sil can fly that high. He can do that with Step of the Wind. So I'm going to use another of his key points for having him soar on up towards the Incubus and making a strike with his bonus action since he has to use his action to continue to fly there. Can I ask a question? I think uh, that we might already know about them, but I've forgotten. Have Has anyone cast fire magic on them? And that's why we're not using it, because we know that the demons have resistance to fire magic. Do we, like, kn- know that for sure? You know that some demons have been resistant. Doesn't mean all demons are. I, yeah, I tried I tried a fireball. That's what I'm saying. Like, when we met them in small points, didn't we do something and then realize? I'm not trying to, like, meta. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, there was a fireball flung at them. Not at them. It was flung oh, at the demon. Oh, the, the, the little things. The little things were resistant. The quadras were resistant, and you also fought that large demon that they had summoned. And then also the demon dancers came and used fire as well. But they've never seemed to have been touched by that. So you're not sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Sil's going to use his attack and then shoot forth a stunning strike. Well, I'm assuming that's what you would all would want him to do. Yeah, knock that bitch to the ground. <laughs> All right, he's going to make his first attack. Oh, at advantage in a dirty 20. 16 points of damage, and then he's going to release a stunning strike. So, constitution saving pose for Jalen. All right, once again, though, the ever-stout Jalen manages to stave off his strike, but taking massive damage. Jalen's looking very rough, but he seems determined to finish his incantation, and he does not fall to the ground. Now squared with him. He will end his turn. All right, Cal, you're up. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is kind of move myself over here. And I'm going to fire off 
a round of my magic pistol. I have one bullet in each revolver still, and I'm going to fire it at the unidentified demon. It's an 18. That hits. Roll damage. And then I'm going to use my other attack to fire the last one of my other revolver, magic revolver. Ooh, natural 20. Yeah, I'm definitely going to uh, Divine Smite this one. Yeah, it'll automatically apply the crit, but not for the Divine Smite, though, so you'll have to roll that one. Okay. Oh, and fire it off again. All right. Once again, firing off shot for shot. How much bullets do you have left? I don't have any bullets left in those revolvers, but I still have a bonus action. How is this thing looking? It's looking hurt, but has a little fight left into it. All right. Well, then I'm going to use my bonus action to drop and grab the shoulder holster pistols and use an action surge to attack two more times. All right. Let me just stare at you, check to see if you drop the pistols on the ground or if you're able to get into the holster. Oh, awesome. A check or a save? Check. Or it doesn't matter. Cause you're, check because you're doing it. Oh, yeah. You manage. You let go of the two magic pistols uh, and in the same motion, grab the top two uh, regular pistols in their holsters before the magical ones land in place perfectly. You whip out and make your... Oh, that's super awesome. That's going to miss. Second that one's going to hit. And... Doing 12 damage, though, you know, as you see, the mundane bullet hit it. It heals up quickly, partially the damage that you've inflicted upon it. Uh, we need to kill this thing. And that's it. Okay, next up. <sighs> the creature is going to look over. And after hearing the orders coming from Balin, it disappears. You appearing next to you, Horatio, you see this large boar gorilla-like creature staring directly at you as if your invisibility means nothing to it. And it's going to go ahead and make strikes against you. Oh, but first, or she just happens at the end. All right, it's going to make strike one. All right, so the first one is a 16. Does that hit your AC? Horatio uses his reaction to cast shield. All right. What does your AC raise up to? 21. 21. So this one misses. As you use your reaction, you raise up this arcane shield, blasting off its claws. Because it's going to go ahead and try to make another strike against you. And so 25. So that one does hit. Yeah, it hits. So you take 16 points of slashing damage, but you manage to successfully save on your concentration to keep yourself invisible. He's going to go ahead and make his next attack. Oh, a natural one! And he goes down for the bite, which you know is his like, strongest attack. And you manage to just jump out the way as he falls his face directly onto the snow ground. Or picking it up, you see it's covered in snow and dust. And he roars loudly. <laughs> At the end of his turn, his horror Nimbus came back. So I need you to make me a wisdom saving throw. Oh, you pass. Indeed. As he, the smoke and terror comes at you, you're able to stave it off with ease. Seemingly confused, he stares at you before anger uh, carries over his face. He's going to end his turn looking directly into your eyes. Up next is Monaco, top of the round. So how high up are the um, Balin and Jalen? Jalen, who's been speaking in that uh, weird tone, is um, 100 feet. And the Balin is 40 feet. Okay, so she will um, move a little bit, taking, I imagine, no, there's no need to attack him, attack him opportunity. She can, since he's within 120 feet of her, right? Who? Balin. He's a little bit beyond that. You'll have to get a little closer because he's technically up and across. Ah, uh, yes. The, hy the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse. Of course. She'll, uh, she will move uh, an appropriate distance. Just, she, she runs to get underneath them, possibly provoking another attack from this creature when she does so. Okay. Are you aiming at the one that's singing that's about to die or at the other one? The one that's singing. Okay. That's Jalen, right? Yes. Jalen, right. Okay. So I got them. So Jalen is the one she's in the back at. Uh, but she will run to get underneath Jalen and then cast another synaptic stab. Okay, it does not mean you take this opportunity attack against you as it's focused on this, on Horatio. So go ahead Think and next. make your attack. So yeah, so, Monaco, you run up, dodging the demon as it's uh, involved with Horatio. Make your way underneath Jalen before releasing your attack. So describe your killing blow. So she will start to run, and as she does so, she grabs uh, her rod, holding it up in front of her, 
dipping it almost like ink in a brush against her magic book. She carves out in front of her while she's running a stream of letters that says an infernal befuddlement take your mind. And then underneath uh, Jalen, those same words appear for a brief second before an overwhelming force of psychic power just sort of emanates from that point and overtakes them. All right, so as you walk up behind it, uh, you all see Monaco making her way uh, towards it and as she described, releasing this uh, ray of befuddlement onto it. Jalen continues to chant his incantation song, you're not sure, looks down and stops and he goes, oh, sister, uh, and as he's hit by the spell, you see him fall from the uh, from the sky, landing hard onto the ground with uh, his sister looking on in shock. No, Jalen, oh, what have you done, you witch? She points her rod at, uh, at Balin next, and she says, your kind is not welcome here. As he kind of falls down and the last bit of light leaves the incubus's eyes, uh, they stare at each other for a moment and the succubus looking goes, ah, that'll have to do. And she seemingly looks like she's about to run away and fly away. As uh, it does the incubus land? Oh, the incubus lands, yes, hard on the, to the ground. Yeah, Minako runs runs to, to, to make sure to see about the damage. But uh, otherwise, it ends the turn. Okay. You see the damage and you you see all the accumulated damage that he's taken from the slashes, blasts, arrows, and your magic. Check to see if he's indeed dead and he's no longer breathing. His body slowly starts to dissipate until when it finally reaches his head, he, he becomes nothing but dust. She mutters a prayer, but, you know, almost, almost sorry that she had to kill a thing, even if it is a... The succubus will take her turn. She looks on over. Ha! Ah, you haven't seen the last of me. You will rue the day when you have, when you cross paths with Balin and our dark emperor. And she's going to disappear into a shimmer of etherealness and go invisible. Duran, you're up next. So go ahead and make a uh, wisdom saving throw. You do have to start of your turn. Sorry. I'm on it. Oh yeah, you're no longer frightened. So you can, you stave it off and continue making your way to the battle. All right, in this case, Duran is going to cinematically, for distance purposes, run into the back of the caravan and dive out the front of it and keep running to get to the um, to the demon's backside. All right, I would say you have an advantage. Well, not exactly where you're positioned. You wouldn't know exactly where to position yourself, so it'll be normal rolls right now. Sorry, DM, since we go at the same time, could I take my turn, which I'm going to do something that's going to reveal me? If you reveal yourself, sure. You could you could do this while Duran's running up because you would see him coming. Yeah. So as uh, this monstrosity standing in front of me, I say the reason they always go after the practitioners of the arcane arts is because of the fact that we can do whatever we want to ensure victory. And he's going to take out a small piece of iron and uh, cast Hold Monster. So as he says these words, he's moving his hands in a uh, kind of like a Dr. Strangery way with the small piece of iron. And from the piece of iron, like this uh, wave emanates and I cast Hold Monster on uh, on this beast. Okay. What kind of save does it have to make? Uh, it has to make a wisdom saving throw. Okay, it failed. He is paralyzed for up to one minute. And Duran, you can see me now. Okay, dropping one concentration for the other. You reveal yourself holding the beast. Duran, you now notice, and you have advantage on it regardless because it's held, but you can position yourself accordingly now seeing where Horatio stands. So continue to make your take your turn, Duran, at advantage. So Duran is going to slide up on this dude, and he's going to he's gonna swing at him. I'm just getting to the attack action. This is 21. Roll your damage. Nine points of uh, slashing damage. Let me just apply the correct damage. All right, your next attack, Duran. Has Horatio used his reaction yet? To put up shield, yes. Oh, no, it's the start of your turn, so you have your reaction back. So, no, he has not. And keep in mind, you have advantage. He's not. He can't take an opportunity attack because he's held. So I'm oh, yeah, so like, no one cares. Yeah, get him. Yeah, so Horatio would just kind of move away. All right, 26. All right, roll 2d6. Seven points damage. Okay. As Horatio runs around to this side, 
he yells out to everybody, He's held! Now's the time to take him down! Okay, this is looking really rough. As you go with slash by slash, the momentum increasing with each strike of this blade. What do you do next? Duran kind of spins with the extra weight and momentum, and then once again kind of uh, stops himself from moving, adjusting to the new weight and the speed of the new blade. And then he's going to kind of put out a hand and make a come and get it gesture to the demon. Oh, yeah, who can't see me and is also paralyzed. I guess that's pretty much it. <laughs> All right. So using Horatio's magic to keep the beast in place around, you continue to be to strike with a torrent of blade strikes, hitting each one critically, doing a massive amount of damage. The demon's on his last legs, breathing heavily as it cannot move, held in place. Up next is King. What do you do? I'll, like, look to Horatio as he shouts that out and nod. And then I'll fly down towards the ground and land next to the group here and hold Chasifold out towards the demon. And I will release a sacred flame attack against it. It has to make a deck save. Does it auto fail? Auto fail. Okay, so then it takes 2d8 radiant damage. That wasn't that great, but... (laughs) But it is what it is. And... For a bonus action, I will 5, 10, 15, 20, pull Chassifold closer. But unfortunately, he is not within range. So next round, you might be able to hit with it. And I will end my turn. Okay, Syl's going to look around and say, uh, It looks like it's on his last legs. I'm going to take the skies and see if I can find that other one. Horatio yells, be careful. And again, I've gone too far. He's going to use his entire movement to fly up into the sky and begin to scout the area. And he, like, goes off the map at this point. Cal, you're up next. Oh, I'm for sure going to run up to this thing. Stand tall with my companion here, Do Ren, And start blasting away with my regular pistols. As you hit with your first bullet, it heals up, but the healing is slower now. As the beast looks weakened, go ahead and make your next attack. I'm going to look at this thing and say to it, Go back to the abyss and use my last spell slot to hit it with Divine Smite. So, describe your killing blow. The last shot, like I said, I say, go back to the Abyss, and I look over to Doran and also say, just like we talked about earlier, and I pull out like the perfect stance and fire the last one as like a radiant blast explodes out of the end of the barrel of the revolver and devours a greater half of this this demon as it totally just gets blasted away with like a large chunk of its body just completely gone now. Okay, you all witness Cal release two shots from his pistols before the last shot he charges divine energy into the bullet releasing an divine shot this white energy pierces the beast before into his chest and it seems like nothing happens at first and then the beast looks down with a little bit of a strength it has uh, while being held and you all see the light grow deeper go and glow inside of it uh, and get brighter and brighter until it finally explodes its entire top half turning into nothing but guts and innards all over the ground. You all get kind of get covered into it. <laughs> uh, not Horatio, because I'm behind the tent. Well, everyone who was within 20 feet. <laughs> but it does slowly start to dissipate and float into the air before returning to the abyss, and you're all seemingly clean again. And the demon has been destroyed. Dratton turns to Cal, and with a nod... <laughs> Indeed. Victory. All right. So now, alone in this empty, forgotten campsite, you have destroyed the demon, killed off Jalen, but Balin has managed to escape to fight another day. You hear it coming from the caravan. Hey, is it over? Did you guys win? Yeah, it looks like the most, most of the calamity is over. The crystal. And you hear, yeah, you guys, you guys better come and take a look at this. We'll run back over. You guys run over towards the caravan and look into the crystal. Oh, look inside of it. We're opening up the flaps. 
cowering next to the crystal itself, but looking on with the strange, the strange gaze, you see Glem. And now then looking at the crystal, you, you see that it's black, still shining brightly inside, but a completely black, dark hue. I don't know what this means. I'm going to go to my bag and I'm going to pull out the lantern that we had and look at the crystal there. And now, was it just in your, like, your backpack? Yeah, it was like with the belongings that we had in the caravan. You go into your bag quickly and pull out your chalice. It's a little bit heavy, but you manage to get it out. And to your horror, you look and see a black light coming from it as well. It's affected our lantern as well. Do you know how to reverse it, King? I don't know exactly, but I can try. Did you understand what they were saying? Monaco, need your head in this. I don't know what this is, but if it's like what you said before, doesn't that mean that they're going to be coming soon? Everyone roll me a perception check. You all, for the most part, minus Horatio, here. Ooh, uh, <sighs> like different noises of beasts that you don't recognize. You look towards the back of you, to the left and the right, and glowing eyes, so quite a little bit distance away, is slowly making its way towards you. I'm going to rummage through my bag real quick and go to the special satchel and pull out the seed that fell and look at it. Is it still glowing? The seed, as you look at it, it looks very peculiar. It's still glowing, yes, and it has the energy of Miliki, but it's almost as if it's being snuffed and covered. You feel a force uh, acting upon it, but fortunately it doesn't seem to have actually taken any effect to the seed itself. How big is that tent that Monaco, the, the one that Monaco is closest to right now? Tent's about 20 feet radius. So would we be able to get the caravan in there? Uh, no, you would not be able to. I'm going to say um, we need to prepare for an incoming attack. Cal, Minako, can you please help me? I need your energy, and I'm going to grab this seed and then jump out of the thing, and then I'm going to, like, look around, and I guess whichever place has, like, a decent amount of space, I guess I'll go over here to where, like, the ashes are, and I'll say, this is where a new seed must be placed. We must hallow this ground once again, and then I'll start digging and uh, preparing a place to plant the seed. As that is happening... Horatio says to Duran, Duran, we need to provide support. I might be able to summon an aid. Yeah, so I'll say to them while they're over over here, I was like, I know you guys are new to this group, but you must have heard the story about how we made a tree of Heaven's Root appear. Uh, this is the seed of Heaven's Root, and I need you to help me help it grow. You see, as um, Minako is walking towards the pile, she, she unwraps the bandage around her arm, and she started speaking into it, praying almost. And when you when you say that to her, she says, "Yes, whatever I can do." And she just she just say, "Please, please, please, do something." Uh, and you see the the wound. She has a a, a wound on her arm. She normally keeps covered, and it, it seems like it hurts. All three of you, roll me uh, intelligence checks for the quick. Monaco, King, and Cal. Duran's gonna throw his um, new blade on his back and wrap it and pull out Firethorn and ignite it in preparation for defending them from an onslaught of enemies. Okay. Can you remember that while planting the seed did aid you before with Enceladus, it was a combination of the crystals within the mountains themselves and the seed that created the aura. You would possibly need some type of crystal source to really use it to create a hallowed ground. I'll say, oh no, the crystals have been tainted. We might not be able to resonate properly. You're a maiden. Do you know how to make new clean crystals, just empty ones? We, we, we need the do. Uh, uh, do. Do we have any that are clean? I don't know what's going on. I can make the dew from this seed, but it needs a crystal to grow. Didn't we have, weren't they shipping crystals? Yes, they were. In the caravan, there were shipping crystals. M- maybe some of them were okay. And she'll, she'll run to the caravan to check. So you run over to the caravan and make your way past Glem, opening up the, the boxes. And indeed, the crystal don't seem tainted. It gives you an idea. Maybe it's the, the combination with the dew and the new substance it creates together that was tainted on the two chalices that you're carrying. But these raw crystals seem to be okay. You can possibly use this in this ritual you're performing. 
come on, these are fine, come on, help, help me move them. And she'll shout from, from inside. Glam goes, well, but we, I mean, we got plenty, but we need some of those for, for Arrow Watch. You don't want to die, do you? Come on. He goes, right. He turns to you and goes, all right, all right, right. Here, there should be plenty in, in this box here. We, we can use it. We can spare that one, I'm sure. Come on, give me a hand. And she starts, she starts, she just grabs like a handful of them and sort of like puts them into her, into her skirt and kind of. Um, while this is happening, can I attempt to use my lay on hands to neutralize any kind of poison or disease that might be like, you know, metaphysically affecting the crystals and or the soil where you're trying to plant this tree? You may not be able to use this for the cleansing of the crystal, but it can surely help in making the ground that he's planting fertile, holy, as this is more of a like a uh, divine ritual that King is. Yeah, I kind of want to like neutralize and cleanse the earth around where this will be going to give it any advantage to grow quickly. Sure. How much points are you putting into the ground? I'll do 20. 20. All right. So I really want it to work. King, as you called over for assistance from Nako to bring the crystals, and Cal, you reach down to the ground and release your lay on hands, shooting this 20 points of it and this divine energy into the earth below. The rest of you hear the howls and the yips and the grunts of beasts coming, realizing that whatever was protecting you has been gone. Oof. Nice job, guys. And as you settle down and prepare and hunker in, we'll end today's session. Oof. Thank you, everyone. It was a longer session, but you did get through that battle and gain quite a bit of experience, which I'll let you know when you level. No need to tally it. Does that mean that we hit level 10? Not at all, but... <laughs> But you got a good chunk into it. We'll see what happens here. I assumed you guys were going to like try to hop in and run away. But if you're hunkering down and planting it, this will be a quite an interesting uh, interaction that I will write up for next week. Oh, boy. Awesome. All righty. Duran, we need to plan how we're going to hold ground for just the three of us. <laughs>